recording, Michelle? There we go. Okay, good morning. Welcome, John, as well as you come in. It's great to see everybody. Um, I'm just really excited about today. We've got Dr. Cindy with us, um, or we can just call her Dr. Sin. Is that okay? Can I call you Sin? <laughs> Now, I don't think this many needs a lot of introduction, but I'm really excited about today because this is one of the things that, I mean, MICN is all about. You know, we don't claim that, that we have all the answers in some kind of a corporate headquarters. We are a network. We are different churches working together, and I think we all have different things to offer and bring to the table. And so I'm excited about doing this. We've got some other things in mind for future months. Uh, perhaps you have something you would like to offer. You think, oh, I could offer something. Uh, please let me know or... If you have somebody else that you think, oh, you know, like Andy's thinking, oh, Rosemary should do this. Then just tell me what Rosemary should do, and then I'll get in touch with her. Um, but anyway, really, I really appreciate Cindy and that she is willing to be the guinea pig trying something new out. Um, we're excited. I'll give you a little heads up on how this is going to work. For basically 45 minutes or so, Cindy is going to share for a few minutes, and then she's going to lead us into some discussion. Then she'll share for a few minutes, lead us in some discussion, share and discussion. So kind of be like three 15-minute intervals. She'll wrap up at the end, and then we'll have the last 10 minutes for prayer. So that's, that's the format. And with that, I'm going to pray, and then, Cindy, you're going to be up. God, we just thank you so much that we can come together for, as leaders of international churches from all over the world. Uh, I pray for our sister Cindy today, as she has done so many hours of work on this subject of shame. Um, and I know that we, we deal with this in our churches, um, no matter what kind of culture our church is in, we have people from all over the world. So I pray that each of us would leave us something useful that would help us to be better pastors uh, in our own churches. And that Cindy also would leave blessed um, and just edified as, and encouraged that she's been able to not only touch lives in Denang, but touch lives all over the world through investing in each of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, first of all, let me say thank you uh, for the opportunity and what a, a great uh, experience this is for me to share something that's near and dear to my heart. I have been living with this topic uh, for a number of years now. Uh, don't pretend to know a lot of answers, but I'm certainly a lot further down the road in my own understanding, and I hope that today is useful for you. Um, if you come today wondering if shame is really a thing, uh, then we're going to be beyond that in our discussion because I'm assuming you already know that it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, shame uh, reared its ugly head at the garden. Uh, it was not God that declared shame on Adam and Eve. It was their own experience of shame at the moment that they fell before they had ever encountered God the Father after that. And so uh, that's important. That's an important distinction to remember because so many people uh, who experience shame believe that it's God's attitude toward them. And yet we find uh, the remedy for shame really is found in Hebrews 12 when it says that uh, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. And there could have been a lot of things that Jesus despised at the cross, sin, death, wickedness, uh, you know, the fall of the world, of his beautiful creation. But what he despised was the shame. And that word despise really means to make something of no effect. And that's going to be an important distinction to remember as we talk, because most of the literature, whether it's secular or Christian, uh, as well as the Bible itself, doesn't so much talk about uh, eradicating shame as nullifying it, making it of no effect. It's pretty much like, uh, to me, the effect uh, of sin itself. We still experience the effects of this sinful world. Uh, it wasn't that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and all at once his creation is set back uh, to perfection. We still experience it, but we experience it differently on this side of the cross and on our personal side of experiencing redemption and a new birth. And it's much the same with shame. It still exists. Uh, it can still uh, impact our lives, but we can learn to despise it, to make it of no effect through the power of the cross. So that's where we're going. Um, 
shame is that feeling, that deep feeling of being unworthy of love at its heart. It is different than guilt. Guilt says, I did something bad. Shame would say, I am something bad. There is something wrong at my very core that will never be right. I am unworthy of love. I am unworthy at my basic uh, existence of uh, being accepted. I shouldn't be accepted. I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm not capable of receiving that. And uh, it is both biology and biography. And what I mean about by that is that uh, most of us, if we're talking about shame, will go back to one of two things. We will either blame our family of origin, you know, my mom did it to me, <laughs> uh, you know, or uh, my parents, it was my family, or some traumatic event that brought shame upon us. But I think biblically, as we were just, you know, as I just said, shame is rooted in the fall. And because of that, it is a universal experience by everyone. And it is not a case where some people have it and some people don't any more than sin. Some people have it and some people don't. Uh, creation, all of creation fell at the fall. And when shame entered the world, uh, I, I tell people that um, you may not know where shame, you know, where you found shame. But even if you didn't, didn't find it, it will find you. Uh, you could grow up in the perfect family. Your parents could have been and who does everything right? Uh, nobody. So, uh, but it doesn't matter. You will find uh, the effects of shame are in our world. So it doesn't have to be that uh, some people would say, well, I, I have this deep sense of unworthiness, but it's not because of my family of origin. You know, I had pretty good parents and I can't remember a traumatic event. Uh, that's because shame is a result of the fall. And because of that, it's universal. Uh, just quickly, I want to say that throughout this discussion, we're going to talk a lot about Ruth, the book of Ruth. I chose that as a case study for this topic because I particularly wanted to look at expats, uh, both Ruth and Naomi, the principal um, people in this book, other than Boaz, uh, both lived as expats. They both had uh, cultural, experiential, and personal reasons why they would have felt shame. And yet, uh, both women rise above that and uh, affect all of history, and especially redemptive history. And if God did that in their lives, I believe he can do that in our lives as well. So as we go to our first uh, questions here, um, I want you to think, what are some ways that you see shame exhibited in yourself or in your church or people that you know? Uh, you know, shame doesn't, people don't always realize it's shame that is causing their behavior or the way they always respond in certain situations. So think about that. Uh, the other thing I want you to think about, you might want to address this is, why would shame uh, show up differently or seem to be highlighted in the life of an expat, in the life of someone who is living in ministry uh, outside of their own country? Why would this be uh, of particular importance to the international church and to expats in general? Okay, so those are a couple questions to get started, and I've got a couple more if we, um, you know, run out of discussion time with those. Anybody want to start? How do you think you see shame show up, either in your life or in the life of your church or people you know? And why, why would this be um, important to expat living, or what about living as an expat minister would... Um, you know, hinder or enhance the effects of shame. Anybody want to start? Oh, y'all are going to make me work for it. 
Okay, I'll start. There we go. So you can you can take a breath. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, I think there's um, I think there's an overlap between the two questions uh, as well. I think one of the things that comes to mind, and I'm thinking of a conversation I've got in about an hour and a quarter's time with a, a leader from a, a Southeast Asian uh, country, is especially the international church. Um, just the whole mixture of cultures, but there may well be a dominant culture kind of in the background of that church that many of that church um, that's considered the norm. So for us, that dominant culture is is Dutch, um, which is very forthright, very direct. Um, oh, how can I word it in a gracious way? It's sometimes rather opinionated, um, and happy to give you a pin so in books like erin meyer's the culture map the dutch are right at the left-hand extreme of giving direct negative feedback which they will see as not being negative um the impact that has on other people including myself as a brit who's a little bit further along the spectrum um at times in and of itself can be something which causes shame um, people might not word it that way, but they suddenly feel that they're no good or they can't lead. So the leader I'm talking to, um, the team that she's taking on has various Westerners in it. And we need to talk through that dynamic. And some of it I know is shame. It's also self-deprecation and other things going on. Um, but I think that's a, to me is a big factor. And I'm not by that trying to say Dutch people are the devil incarnate wonderful <laughs> and i really thank god for them uh, and cause many of us that dutch people experience shame for other reasons because it's family background or some cases another thing in our country i think is church background i would joke here that even even the atheists are strict are strict calvinists and that has a really big inbuilt shame factor to it especially if you've worked out you're, you're one of the chosen ones to go to hell, there's lots of steps that you can still go and worship and they believe that. You know, so there's all that. Anyway, I'm not one to start Calvinism and Arminian argument up, but that's a couple of things for me. So I, I felt it personally, but I've also seen it very much in members of the congregation. Yeah. The multiculturalism really does affect the experience of shame and also how it's communicated. What else about expat living, uh, particularly as ministers? What would you think might, um, you know, influence the experience of shame and also how you express it? Anybody? I think that um, part of the issue for us um, dep depends on how long you've been in a context, but you know, for us, we've been here a little short of three years, but working mainly in an English environment, so our, our command of the local language and culture is about, it's about that of a three-year-old. Um, and that, um, that brings embarrassment and a certain amount of, sh you know, that sense of shame when you're engage engaging with, with local people um, and this, this sense of being you know, you're 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 a you're a fully functioning adult in your own culture, right? But not in your host culture. Yeah. And, that, and that, 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 I think that makes a huge difference to how you, how you view yourself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all of those things, you know, shame, um, as you might guess, is characterized by not being able to look people in the eye when you talk to them. Uh, maybe by, uh, you mentioned self-deprecation, when someone always has to deflect a compliment by making fun of themselves or putting themselves down, uh, that can be saying, it's one thing to do that to lighten the mood when things are getting, you know, really pointed, a pointed discussion, and it's a, a little bit of comic relief. It's another if you can never accept the compliment or if you can never have a serious discussion because to do so would cause you to reveal yourself. 
you know, people who are living under shame do not want to be known. Uh, they want to hide. And the way we stay hidden is, is to protect ourselves. And if you're going to have any kind of frank discussion, even if it's not particularly uh, personal to you, if you're really going to discuss things that matter um, about theology or, you know, really about anything, if it's something that really matters, uh, it can be revealing of yourself. And a person who is hiding in shame, that's the worst thing of all. And so they avoid it. And an easy way to avoid it is humor. You know, the person that always has to make the joke, uh, the person that when you're talking about something very serious, they think of a, a joke to crack to bring humor and laugh. I uh, remember one person saying to me years ago, you know, every time when you crack a joke and you're laughing, it's at the very point where I think it would be appropriate if you would cry. But we don't want to cry because it, uh, it reveals ourselves. And the whole idea of shame is self-protection. Uh, expat living exacerbates that because uh, I don't know how it is where you live. We, we've been here in Vietnam for 12 years. Uh, there's only one other family I know of that's lived here longer than us in Da Nang one other expat family. And most don't stay more than two years. And that uh, frequent moving of always being new uh, really helps you not to yourself to others. Uh, it can be the same. You can stay in the same city and church hop. Uh, again, to keep from having to disclose your feeling, your thought, and really anything about yourself, anything personal. The person in shame, it, it becomes irrational. It's not that you have to bear your soul. There's just this inordinate uh, fear of being known. Because again, you have the feeling that if they know me, they won't like me. If they know me, they won't love me because I'm not worthy of love. And it is irrational. It's not, you know, it's not true, that, but that's why it's shame. You know, that's why it's a, um, a result of the fall. It's something direct that the enemy does in our lives. So that's how it shows up. It is, um, you know, uh, universal, but especially for expats where we have made it so easy to hide. Uh, and sometimes have pushed our ministry leaders too high because, you know, you always want to appear strong and that you've got the answers. And if, even if you say, oh, I don't have all the answers, you had better live like you do. You had better live like you do have it all together, even if you're claiming out of one side of your mouth that you don't. And, uh, you know, the, uh, in a minute we're going to talk about vulnerability. Uh, and I guess we'll maybe move on to that uh, for our time's sake, because I really do want to hear from, uh, you know, from you on what you think. Uh, my research shows, uh, I found two things. This is not, these are not the only things, but I chose two things in my studies that I think are the keys to overcoming uh, to nullifying the effects of shame, to despising shame. Again, it's not that you're going to eradicate it, but how do we overcome it? How do we make it of no effect so it doesn't control us? It doesn't influence us. Uh, we despise it. And I, I think there are two key components. And the first one of those is vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability is uh, the ability to be hurt. And vulnerability, like it or not, it is woven into the fabric of creation and of God's uh, revelation of himself. Who, who is more vulnerable than God himself who gave free will to his creation to reject him? Uh, he is always at risk. Uh, he has always put himself out there 
without the guarantee that we will respond. And we see through history, in, the, in biblical history, and in our own lives as well, that, uh, you know, we have not always chosen to follow him, and his people have not always chosen. The, you know, the sorrow of Israel in their captivity, and then, in, uh, you know, uh, we're doing a series right now on the book of Ezekiel. Um, God has always made himself vulnerable, and uh, it is his example to us, I believe, on how to despise shame. Because, uh, you know, sometimes shame says you must protect yourself, but we never uh, follow through on that thought. Or what? Or what? I will die if I'm hurt. I will die if, I, if I'm exposed to people and they reject me. Uh, we will not die. We will go forward. In fact, we'll probably experience a lot of freedom uh, if that is not a controlling factor in our lives that we must protect at all costs. Uh, that is not God's way. Uh, you know, Jesus laid aside his kingly right to take on the form of a man and to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Uh, so vulnerability is all through the fabric of both creation, but also redemption. Um, we think that Strength means we can't be hurt. Real strength is the willingness uh, to be hurt. The willingness uh, to bear the hurt, uh, not to have to protect ourselves from like out back at, at whoever hurts us, but to be able to bear it. Uh, that's what we see in the life of Jesus. Um, Vulnerable relationships are probably the number one thing as far as secular literature that is brought out again and again as a uh, remedy to uh, succumbing to the effects of shame in our life. And real quickly, I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, probably everybody here has heard of Brene Brown. Uh, she really, in recent years, has written a lot on shame and has brought it to the forefront again, and then other authors have also uh, taken up that mantle and write about it, but she names four characteristics of vulnerable relationships that are really important, I think, for us to remember. First of all is trust. There has to be trust that you're not going to, um, you know, reveal my, whatever I share with you, I can trust you with it. You're not going to go tell, you know, everybody else about it. That there's mutual empathy. Uh, you know, vulnerability is not oversharing. It is not dumping your problems on people that don't have relationship with you. Vulnerable relationships must have a mutual empathy. Uh, so the people that come to our church, and you know them, and I know, I've known many, that every new group they're in, they regurgitate their holes you know, sad past, they have to say it again and again. The reason they're not despising the shame in that is that is not an empathic vulnerability. It's not mutually empathic. They are all, they're just never getting the need met because there is no exchange of empathy. And so um, that's important, a reciprocal sharing if I come to you and just tell you all my deepest, darkest heartaches, but you don't tell me, that's a counseling session. That's not a vulnerable relationship. And to uh, despise the shame, it must be reciprocal. I listen to you as well as you listen to me. And there has to be, again, it must be mutual. Where if, I'm, if I tell you my hardest, you know, the things that I'm just really afraid of, and then you come back to me with something just surfaced, I'm going to back off from you. Because I know I've just bared my soul, and you're not willing to go there with me. Uh, and then last, and this is probably the greatest, I think one of the greatest keys, it is for me anyway, is there has to be the ability to ask for what you need. Uh, 
you know, I find it not so difficult in a, in a small group, especially women that I know. I don't find it really difficult to even share on a deep level. I do find it difficult to ask for something. I find that very difficult. Um, and that tells me if that relationship really is a vulnerable relationship. Now, I'm not saying that I don't have anybody I can ask for what I need. I'm just saying there are levels. That is a great test to me, for me personally, if I am in a vulnerable relationship. It's not just to be able to say your true feelings. It is, can I ask this person for help, real help that I need? I, you know, and the more perfectionist you are, the harder that is because, and some people think it's because the perfectionist wants to do it all themselves. I believe the reason the perfectionist, as one, <laughs> does that is we know what it costs someone else to give us what we need. And we're not willing to ask them to pay that price. Or maybe we're afraid they won't want to. Uh, but if you are a perfectionist in ministry, it won't always show up that you just say, well, I'm the only one that can do this right. Some of the time, the reason you're not asking for help is you know what it costs someone to do it, and you're not willing to put that burden on them. You would rather carry that weight yourself. Uh, so asking for what you need. So with that in mind, I want us to move on to, the, to these discussion questions. Uh, first of all, you can share this or not, but I want you to, at least in your own, you know, maybe jot it down for yourself if you have any. Uh, where are my own vulnerable relationships as a leader? Do I have any? Again, the, that last, could I ask for help? I mean, real help that costs them something. Uh, you know, that the level of sharing is important, but if you can ask someone to put aside their rights and pay a price for you, that's probably a vulnerable relationship. So first of all, think, where are mine? Do I have any? Do I have any? And if you've moved recently to where you are and haven't maintained some deep connections, uh, you may not, you know, it takes time to develop these, but you need to look at that. And then this is beyond, vulnerable relationships is beyond small groups. Uh, when you're thinking about your church, how do we facilitate vulnerable relationships? Small groups are great, but we need to facilitate something deeper than that, than just a group of people getting together you know, to talk or, or study the Bible. They can become that, but the, the bigger they are, the less likely that is to happen. The more mixture of gender and age and stage of life, the less likely that is to happen. Um, so we need to consider how are we uh, facilitating vulnerable relationships in our ministry context. So those two questions, where are my vulnerable relationships as a leader? Do I have them? And secondly, what am I doing if I've got it? What am I doing in my church or ministry context to facilitate it for others? You can't make it happen, but you can, you can provide the opportunity. Okay, anybody wanna share? I actually want to reverse it if I can. Sure. Um, I've been counseling a woman for several weeks who's going through a lot of shame issues and she is looking for vulnerability in me. So she's looking for, she's constantly asking questions like, well, where are you vulnerable? Not, not that directly, but she's looking for that. Where's that healthy divide between counseling and being mutually vulnerable in a pastoral situation? 
Well, I have thoughts, but I won't be the first one to jump in. <laughs> so my daughter's been saying, get your admin. Go get your admin and never, never, ever meet her alone. <laughs> That's my first thing. If, if it's another gender, man, just never, ever close the door. It just is totally, utterly vulnerable. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's not the kind of bone. It's it's um, she's eager to dig into my past and find out what are the what are the father issues that I've had. What are she, she's because she's struggling with a lot of father issues, and she's looking to find a mutual vulnerability in me to see if I'm dealing with the same things. And so, where does the vulnerability versus the counseling? Where's where's that line? Well, to me, it sounds like, number one, this is a counseling situation, not a vulnerable relationship. And I would not make it a vulnerable relationship. Uh, I think what, um, you know, what was just shared is so important. It may not be to you a relationship issue. I, I would be very surprised if to her it's not. Uh, you know, we have many needs, um, and men and women are different in how they perceive things and, and in those emotional needs. Uh, I think the best, if she really wants vulnerable relationship, I would encourage you to facilitate a, another woman who is about her age, but a very mature, you need a mature woman, um, who knows how to set some boundaries. Yeah, also, you know, there's a, I don't know this lady at all, but how he can try to take over your life, you know, uh, but for their own needs. And uh, I would encourage you to keep that a counseling relationship, not a vulnerable friendship, because nobody ever thinks Nobody ever intends to, you know, they never plan for an inappropriate relationship or inappropriate attachment, a hurtful attachment. They don't plan for that. But our emotional tanks get empty and we're willing to, you know, it's such a need. Connection is such a need. It is a great temptation uh, and on her part. I'm not saying for you, but it will be. And so I would steer clear myself. I would keep that a counseling relationship and either the door is open or you have a window cut in your door. And I mean half the door, not, not a little people window, a big window um, that everybody can see who walks by. There is no, you know, uh, you, uh, things like that ruin a person's ministry, ruin it. And you've got to guard the, the, um, the trust that God has given you in your ministry at all costs, I, I believe. Anybody else? I wonder if on a broader, on a broader topic, if um, when we talk about vulnerable relationships, that um, these aren't things that you can demand. These are, th this, this is a journey that you walk on together and mm -hmm. you know as you know as you reveal something of yourself to each other in a peer relationship not a, i mean a counseling situation is a power is a power imbalance and you'd be aware of that but we're talking about vulnerable relationships as a peer relationship that it's not something you can demand of the other right. so if it's if it's being demanded then it's in some way not going in the direction of vulnerable relationship it's, there's a certain amount of you know of manipulation going on there yes yeah, I think balance is really a key you know whether whether you're willing to give something and I think it's also really important to have vulnerable relationships going up status wise as well as peers and also down um, I could ask things and maybe because I'm a type 8 Enneagram <laughs> But I could ask things of my superintendent. I could say, if you can't help me and you can't tell me, who can? And I would be that direct. But when I was in my early 30s, my husband said to me, look, I'm not Jesus. Go find some girlfriends. And that totally 
changed my vulnerability because he was never home. He was working three jobs <laughs> and there was nothing left for us and the kids. And so I went and I just prayed for a couple of years. Honestly, it took a while. I found one gal who just made me laugh. I mean, everything about her background was similar to mine, her Germanists, her immigrant parents, the jokes, the kids' words, that was all the same. And so we had some, something in common. And then I asked her, would you ever be interested? I approached her and I said, would you ever be interested in this? And then I said, I want two things. If you're willing, and if, if you're willing to ask somebody else and include somebody else, because I think you and I aren't going to get that far. I said, let's look for women who are, who are on the hunt for God. And let's look for women who can keep a secret. Because I'm going to tell you everything, and if you tell, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and the four of us, we, there were three of us at first, and the Lord said to me, you need one more. So I started looking and thinking, oh, who is that? And about four months after we started, we had a group. And that group has been together for 30 years. While I lived in the States, we met every three weeks, had breakfast, had lunch, whatever. They are so different than I. They're feminine. They love pretty things. They made a girl out of me. I grew up with three brothers. And you fought for every inch of the plate, you know. So they would just say to me, Rosemary, what on earth are you thinking? And five and ten years in, Rosemary, why are you still dealing with that? You know, those, those gals saved my life. They saved my marriage. I still trust them. Yeah. But I also have now a mastermind, a peer mastermind, which is we meet on a year's contract, informal contract. We all agree. Everything is secret. And also, we're on the hunt to see what God is doing. We meet once a month for two hours. However many show up, you get that piece of the hour. So if there's six showing up in the two hours, you each get 20 minutes. You get to say whatever you want. And we have heard everything and we have said everything. And they hold our feet to the fire. And I would say that is just a marvelous relationship. It, it's, it's gender specific. If a guy came in, that would wreck the whole thing. And same yeah. thing with my husband's coffee group. If a woman came in, you know, I showed up at the restaurant once when the guys were meeting and they went like, no women welcome. I said, don't care, don't want to be part of your group. Thank you. Right? But but it's it's specific. And I think what, what Cindy said, age change, I mean, the age range of these women, they're within 20 years of me. I'm yeah. a young one. Yeah. But you can have a mix, but you have to have something in common. Yeah. The, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Just real quick. I think that's really good, Rosemary. I just want to make this point real quick, and then I also wanted to offer another answer, Cindy. But um, I think what John brought up is so important. But also, Rosemary, one of the things you said kind of touches on this. Not every relationship needs to be a fully vulnerable relationship. And there are different relationships, and they right. have different, there are different types, and that's appropriate. And it can be very difficult for a pastor to have really vulnerable relationships with people in his church or her church. Now, that can. I'm not saying it can't happen. I've got some people in my church that I'm very close to. But I think we have to understand, it's kind of like with our kids. We're not necessarily going to share everything with our kids. It's just not the right relationship. And that's okay. It's okay to have boundaries, John. And so that's where I think saying, no, you know, I'm not going to go there with you. That's not the role. Um, it's okay. You, you don't have, we don't have to feel like, uh, and Cindy is saying, every relationship should be fully transparent. Um, and that wouldn't be healthy. We wouldn't be able to handle that. Um, now, just to shift gears to your second question, Cindy, you had asked about what do we can do in our churches. And actually, it really excited me what you were saying, because in our church, we, in the last couple of years, have been developing a triad discipleship group ministry, where we're putting people into gender-specific groups of three people. And we don't force those groups. We actually have a key person, and they invite two others in, kind of like Rosemary did. And we've seen some real benefits in discipleship, but what I hadn't realized was this shame issue. And I realized as, as I'm thinking through it, yeah, I can see testimonies I'm hearing. You know, you got three guys that are together and they're just sharing once a week. There is a plan. It's a, it's a limited time thing. Like it's a 12 week kind of commitment, but most of them after 12 weeks are continuing to meet. And it's just that, that vulnerable relationships are happening that mutual empathy. So um, I feel really good that that's something that we're trying to, it's expanding in our church. It's growing as people getting involved, inviting more people in. And it's something we're, we're doing partially with real life ministries, which you may never, never have heard of. 
Um, but we're working, MICN is working to have a partnership with them. And that's something that then we're hoping to introduce more of our churches in MICN to just so you can know about it. So this could be something that I was using the discipleship, but may also be attacking shame in a really neat way. Good. That is, uh, you know, so key. Uh, part of during the, in writing the dissertation, part of my research, of course, was about um, Wesley small groups, John Wesley small groups. And, uh, you know, everybody's heard about, that's why they were called Methodists, is he had methods. But he had three different kinds of groups for different purposes. And some were mixed gender and mixed age, just everybody. But when they got to, the, I think it was the bands, um, they were gender specific, most of the time an age range specific, and uh, also much more limited to uh, no more than five to seven people, but sometimes uh, even less. And it was the most, um, it was kind of like the group that Rosemary was sharing about, uh, you know, where everything is, uh, there's complete trust among each other. Uh, there is a mutual uh, empathy and also a mutual sharing and the ability to ask. But also, um, really something surprising happened to me. Uh, I'm kind of like what David was saying about in ministry, it's been very difficult for me to develop that kind of relationship. Um, you know, I'm always aware that I don't want anybody to think a pastor's playing favorites and has their little group, you know, has one person that they really key into and they're, and that they're out, you know, and, uh, but the way it has happened is, um, uh, I didn't ask a lady to do something for me. She saw a need and did it. She saw a real need, something I really needed, and I would never have asked her to do it, but she saw it and did it. Uh, and when that happened, it was like a, it was it just as if I had asked her, and it opened the door, and, um, you know, we are similar in age. I'm a little bit older, but not much. We have similar age children and children that have responded to life in similar ways that have been a challenge for their parents. And, uh, you know, it's been really great uh, to have that. But that was something the Lord did. And I would just encourage you that if you're looking at your life and you're like, I don't really have that, or I have, I have that relationship, but it's 8,000 miles away, uh, that can be helpful. But, it, you know, sometimes you need somebody a little closer than that. Um, then ask God to show you who it is. Uh, or, you know, to bring that person to you, but you may see, they may not ask you, but if you see a need that you can meet for them, do it. You know, it may be the Lord might use that. He certainly did in my life. I would never have, have said, could you help me with this? And she saw it and did it, you know, and uh, it, it opened the door. Uh, well, I want to move on because we are, you know, time is of the essence. <laughs> and I, I did want to talk about one other main uh, area because um, vulnerable relationships is one of the things that make the biggest difference in uh, despising shame in our life. Because if someone really does know you, the enemy or even the voices in your head have a hard time telling you you're not worthy when you know that someone has declared you are. Uh, you know, you don't believe that anymore because you know there is someone who knows you, who you have said the, you know, the terrible secret uh, to or whatever, and they have not rejected you, and it nullifies, it despises the shame. Uh, in the life of Ruth and Naomi, there was another thing uh, that seemed to come up to me again and again, and that is uh, the choices they made were rooted in fundamental beliefs, and I started calling them redemptive bias. Uh, you know, we all know what a bias is. It's an intrinsic belief. We just believe it, and uh, we act out of that belief out of that bias. And if we could have, to me, both Ruth and Naomi exhibit 
redemptive bias. Now, I'm also using now the language of anchors, uh, the, the, the rooting and grounding that we live out of. Uh, you know, Naomi, in all of her sorrow and dejection, and when she wanted people to call her bitter, uh, you know, because of what had happened in her life, uh, she had remarkable faith to get up from Moab and return as an older woman to make that journey, uh, to go back, to, to send Ruth, to keep Ruth with her. You know, she, she knew that Ruth was risking everything uh, to go with her and to adopt her in. Naomi really could have demanded a kinsman redeemer from day one but that would not have provided for Ruth. And so there's this intrinsic uh, love, loving kindness, chesed. Uh, the Bible talks about that both women show it is, a, it is rooted in them um, and they act out of it. And I believe that another way to despise the shame is to live our life out of anchors or redemptive bias, and this is where the research is very interesting, because you may say, well, you know, a bias is something I just have, I can't control it, but the research does not show that. Uh, you know, there are many um, neuro neurologists and people that are in that world of science that talk about rewiring our brain. Uh, we can change our brain the way we think, and we mainly do it through behavior, uh, that when we choose to act out, you know, let's say I'm not very loving, well, it did happen to me. I was not, I have not historically been a very generous person, uh, and I think part of it is I grew up in a, a family that was um, more impoverished, and I've always been worried there wouldn't be enough and I have really struggled with giving. But at some point, late in my uh, discipleship walk, it wasn't early on, I decided to live and to behave as though I was a generous person. And I started to give more, uh, not only in my tithes and offerings, but in when I saw people in need or tipping, uh, you know, the, ca the taxi cab driver, the grab driver, or uh, people that delivered food to my house or whatever it was, I started acting like I was the generous person that I wanted to be. And I'm telling you, it has made a difference. I started acting like I was, and I became it. Uh, I, I don't hold things so closely anymore. I know it's true. I know it in my own heart. I'm not afraid of giving. But there had to be the behavior, just trying to talk myself into it or memorize verses or, um, you know, preach myself a sermon. Uh, those things were good, but I had to behave out of it for it to really take a root in my life, to really change my paradigm of how I looked at it. And uh, I think all through the book of Ruth, you see a redemptive bias, an underlying feeling. You know, Ruth had tremendous faith to say, my God is your God. I'm, this is it. They, the, she didn't know if the people of Bethlehem would accept her as their people. She didn't care. If her bias was, your God is my God. Your people are my people. Where you die, I will die. Uh, it was a redemptive bias. She lived her life out of that kind of faith. Now, Naomi, I feel like her bias was more intrinsic. Uh, you know, she was a Hebrew. She had all that heritage, all that. And this is where, you know, Christian parenting, uh, we, we have a lot to say about planting those seeds. But Ruth did not grow up in Bethlehem. She did not grow up among the people of God and hearing the stories of God. So it is not only something that can be developed from uh, an intrinsic root. It can be chosen. And Ruth's 
redemptive biases of faith, of Hesed love, that overwhelming loving kindness. Your good is my good. Uh, I will lay down my life for you. Um, that kind of bias, that kind of anchor that then propelled her to action. So it became a cycle. You know, I, I believe that uh, the research shows that we change the, even the, um, the connections in our brain through behavior, through living life, we are the thing we, we want to be. At, but eventually it takes hold and then we are acting out of that redemptive bias or out of that anger, which then propels us to even greater behaviors and spiraling downward, it is a spiral upward. Uh, we, are, we are encouraged and more of that thing, that good, um, intrinsic value, that redemptive bias, and it propels us on to uh, better behavior. So um, we're, we're almost to the time that we need to stop, I believe, but uh, I just want you to talk about for a minute, uh, you know, in a church, in an international church, we have an ability to set a culture, a tone of our own anchors, our redemptive bias, uh, the worth of people, of all people. You know, that's why we welcome everyone. You don't have to prove your pedigree, your doctrinal position, your behavior. We, we love you and we welcome you because our redemptive bias says that all people are created in the that they are of love and respect and care and, um, you know, kindness. That is a redemptive bias. So thinking about your church, what does your church structure, your programs, your preaching, what does it say about what your anchors are? What does your church, at the bottom of it all, I'm not just talking about doctrinal position, you know, we believe the Bible, we believe in the um, triune God and those things. What are your anchors that, that everything else comes out of, that you're living out of? And then uh, to think about in your own personal life, what are your anchors? What does your behavior say about where your real rock solid uh, belief is? And you know, if you have no vulnerable relationships, it will be hard for you to prove that, um, you know, uh, self-acceptance is an anchor or that uh, faith in God, that his love for you is a real anchor because you don't believe you're worthy of love from anyone, especially from a holy God, right? So look at your behaviors. What are they saying about what your anchors are, your redemptive biases? Uh, and if they're not saying about you or your church what you want them to be, what behaviors would be there if you were that? Just like I did with the, the generosity thing. What would I, how would I live even while I'm still thinking, oh, am I going to have enough at the end of the month? Should I really give this or should I help that person or should I give extra here? Should I wait till I see if it's safe? Even while I still felt like that, I started behaving out of the idea that I am a generous person. And it changed my internal uh, bias that there won't be enough. I'm going to run out. I won't, I won't have what I need at the end. Uh, you know, so think about those things. Um, it's 3.57, so I'm going to throw it back to uh, David to pray for us. But there's so many things. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say is, uh, you know, this is so important because uh, you cannot give what you do not possess. But the other side of that is you cannot help but give what you do possess. 
And if you are shame-filled and guarded, you will not be able to help but communicate that to others. You know, we all want freedom and we want to give others freedom. We want to lift them up and propel them forward. But to do that, we have to own that ourselves. We have to be able to live from that ourselves because it's not just that we won't be able to give it, we will also give what we do have. And if that is fear, if that is shame, uh, you know, whatever, uh, we can't keep ourselves from giving what we do have as well. So, David, back to you. I can't keep, I can't keep up with my notes and come back to you here. Um, this is fantastic, Cindy. And I just, yeah, I think we all appreciate it. Um, I, I think, and, and heck, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think I've got a sermon here. I've got a bunch of notes. I can just flesh this out a little bit. And <laughs> so thanks for the help on the sermon prep. Um, we would love to be able to keep going, but I do see the time. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to go into a time of prayer in just a second. If you need to go, we understand that. Um, we'll try to spend about 10 minutes in prayer. Um, if you want to stay around, then we'll be praying for each other. Um, just really do appreciate, really, really do appreciate Cindy and all the preparation that you put into this today.